forgotten, let's record this part as well. Alright. Okay, so this painting is called the School of Athens. It's by a famous Renaissance painter called Raphael. Okay, so this is in, uh, I think it's in the Vatican City if you go and see the actual. These two figures, this is Aristotle and this is Plato. So you know the figures, so these are not Romans, these are Greeks actually. Okay, so you know the sequence of the great philosophers, this much you should know even as MBA students. So first in line is Socrates, after that is Plato and then Plato's student is Aristotle. So this is called the School of Athens because Plato ran a school in Athens called the Academy. Okay, where there was no attendance, no grades. No exams, but there was one minute, but there was, there was CP and then the end result was Aristotle. So Aristotle is Plato's student at the academy. Okay. So this basically, uh, I mean, this is why I, my view is if you want to reform higher education, what you do is you get rid of exams, degrees, uh, uh, everything else, grades. Okay. But you have placement. So companies will not hire fools, so the students will know that they have to learn. Because right now you have a lot of crutches. You have crutches, your crutch is your degree. I've got degree. Some of you are collecting certificates. I've got certificates. But how much knowledge you have, I think with five minutes of probing in the interview, we find out. Like we found out yesterday that some people don't know what overhead is. Okay. So um, anyway, so just keep that in mind. It's part of your knowledge. Okay, so let's go back to where we were. I think what were we discussing last yesterday? We were discussing, I was giving you a project brief, but I think we've come to the point we have covered all this. Obviously, we were discussing market makers and we discussed, I think, uh, the secondary capital markets unit as uh, a, a species of market making operation. Okay, so I think this much is pretty much done. This this is pretty much done. So remember once again, many of you got this wrong in the exam. In the in a typical market making operation, you'll have what are the three functions that you'll have through in the front office. A market making operation is a pretty big operation. If you go to one of the big uh, universal bank kind of setups where they will actually have like even the secondary cap capital markets trading operation and the FX trading operation all together under one roof. That's a huge operation. So you will have front office, middle office, back office. So all these splits are given. But in the front office, what are the three common functions, three main functions in the front office? Yes. Is my question clear? In a market making operation, okay. Yes. Trading, research and sales. Okay. But some people are murmuring, but the, the confidence level is very low. So you can see all this stuff. This is all basic stuff. Okay, it's just and it's not even very high high level conceptual learning or anything like that. It's just that you need to know the terrain. If you're going in as finance students, you need to you need to know how the industry is organized. So this basic stuff which you've been taught, I don't know why people are not able to there should have been a resounding roar from the whole class saying sales trading and research. But your attention levels are very poor. And even in the exam, people couldn't answer simple questions like this properly. Okay, so the question is quite anyway. So this is your market making operation. So you have front and front, middle and back office. Okay, so I've already written that in the notes. You can check that out. So next we go to advisors. This is an important aspect. This is again, remember, these are atomic level functions. Okay, so I've taken the essence of the function and put them as a type of firm. Okay, so if you see, for instance, what happens typically is one of the so under advisors, we have these people. We can't see everything here. Should we make it smaller? Can the guys at the back read, uh, Guy, are you able to read monetary policy? Lender of last resort. Are you able to read it? No? Too small. The font is too small. Okay. No, Guy is not a problem. If we are going to bring people in front, we need to bring problem creatures to the front. <laughs> people who normally cause, who are caught talking. But anyway, so we'll keep, keep, uh, we'll keep you there. Uh, let's see if we can just keep, uh, we want to keep the first seat vacant for, but we had reserved it for Gaba. Where is Gaba? He's not come yet. <laughs> okay, guys, now advisors. Next very important category is advisors. Is everyone clear about market makers? Yes. Any questions about market makers? Next important category is advisors. Under advisors, you can see these are the people. This part, this stuff you can read now, guy. Yes, sir. Font is big enough. Yes. Okay. All right. Independent research. Okay. 
and under independent research I've classified MNA. It's important to understand the essence of the MNA function because you get a lot of uh, bad stuff being uh, <laughs> who's the whose phone is that? Sonam. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? Sonam. Okay, good. So you've made a contribution uh, to your team. Sonam has been scoring runs quite frequently these days. She will be. Uh, she's she is in contention for the man of the series, woman of the series. Okay, where is your team? This is. Sina, you have to keep your team members under control. Okay. So these. All right. Okay. So uh, there's a lot of bad information going around, as you saw some of the courses that were being offered to you from outside, where investment banking that's very common in India, and some people are even, even abroad they make this mistake. They would talk about investment banking, and then they would describe M and A. Okay. So there's a perception that investment banking is M and A. This is completely wrong. Okay, there is nothing about M&A that is intrinsic. I mean, that makes it essentially investment banking. Okay, so we'll discuss this in greater detail. But really, if you understand the M&A function, okay, the M&A function essentially is what I have called an advisory function. It stands along with any kind of independent research, all markets, directional research. Where have you heard this word before? Directional speculators. Right. So under speculators, when we were categorizing market participants, we had categorized them into which three categories? Okay, arbitrages, hedges, and speculators. And under speculators, what are the two categories? Okay, directional speculators and market makers. And you understand if somebody asks you, why are you making this kind of classification? Why are you creating this kind of classification? How would you explain the uh, reason for it? So Let's go one by one, give the mic to Archil. So the question is clear. The question is, in the case of speculators, we have created a sub further sub classification of speculators into directional speculators and market makers. What is the reason for the sub classification? Voice is not coming through the mic. Market makers. I thought she tested it. Not working. Okay, never mind. Then let it go. Let's see. We can't work. Spend so much time on it. Okay, go ahead. The so market makers who give prices, whereas uh, in direct speculators, they are just uh, either buying or selling. But market makers who give prices. Well. Okay, fine. That's a, that's one of the distinctions, but that's not the essential distinction. What she's saying is market makers quote two-way prices. But directional prices so another way of saying that uh, using terms like my price maker price taker would be what another way of saying what you just now what you said just now using terms like price maker and price taker what would you say what would you would the directional speculators be price takers or price makers? they would be price takers and, and this these guys will be price makers so when you when you're whatever you said okay whether it's right or not it's not the main distinction, but even then, when you should said this, you should also use terms like this: that directional speculators are price takers and uh, market makers are price makers. All right. But the essential difference. Anybody wants to go on the essential difference? So that is the so more essential. Mean, price so mean, so why have I used the word directional? So, yes. Market makers focus on less price. Price, less price price yeah. So that is the distinction between. Uh, so Sahil <laughs> has not been able to answer. What was your answer? Give us, give us your answer. Same answer. Okay. So uh, between these two, they have given the right answer, which is the main point of difference. The reason the word directional is used is because so you have to understand this, and you can explain your classification to people. That the main reason the word directional is used is that market makers, the ideal money making condition for a market maker is stable price movement. Okay, not a lot of price movement, but high volumes without much price movement and which happens very often in the markets. Okay, you have some kind of semi equilibrium where prices are moving around in a very tight band and there's high volume. Okay, so that's what market makers want. But in that situation, can directional speculators make money? No, no, sir. no. because they need some kind of big directional movement either up or down in order to make money. Is this clear? So that's why we have the sub classification. Right. So when we say directional, so that's why we're coming, we, we took a jump from this word directional. So when I say all markets, directional research, so under advisory, you have these two broad functions. One is MA because MA is a, I could have just forgot, forgotten about MA. 
and uh, because it's it's just a type of research. But since M&A is such a big uh, you know area of operation for many banks, I've highlighted M&A as a special type of research. But essentially, it is research. And then you have directional research on all markets. What directional research? What that means essentially is this: is that if I have a research firm, okay, any kind of here we are talking about. I think there's so much stuff running. My PC has once again become slow. It is quite slow. This IB TWS consumes a lot of memory, and plus, I guess the recorder as well is taking up a lot of memory. Okay, so if I'm doing directional research, what is my essential service? Okay, remember, essential. So essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this chart of dollar Swiss, or it could be any market. Remember your asset classes, markets, instruments, split. Okay, so directional research. I'm giving you the example of dollar Swiss. This is dollar Swiss. This is which asset class? Cash and spot are not asset classes. Those are instrument types. What is the asset class in dollar Swiss? Currencies. Currencies. Okay, so I'm giving you the example with respect to the dollar Swiss chart, but it could be any market, any asset class, any market, any instrument. Okay, so when I say this, this covers a huge body of research. Okay, so this covers it. When I say all markets, directional research, it's actually all markets, all instruments. Okay, because markets anyway, every market is a type of instrument. When you see a market price, it's always the price of some instrument. Remember, I told you that yes. when we looked at that grid, when we looked at our uh, asset classes, markets, instruments grid, it is whenever you're looking at the price in any market, it is always the price of some instrument or the other. It is either spot or forwards or futures or swap. You don't have any abstract price which doesn't relate to an instrument. Okay, so when I say all markets, it automatically includes markets in all instruments. Okay. All right, so directional research. So what are these guys doing? We are looking at these as independent functions, advisors as independent functions. But essentially, when you see an advisor, when you see research outfits inside a, because I told you, remember, in a market making operation, you will have sales trading and research. Okay, so if you have, let's say, uh, sales trading, SDR. Okay, so in a market breaking operation, you have sales trading and research. Okay, and when I'm talking about when I'm talking about this, so I already had it written down. I didn't see that. So when I'm talking about directional research here as a separate advisory function, the way you have to think about this framework is that it's as if when you see a, a, a say, uh, when you see a research uh, unit inside a market making operation here okay it's as if you took the fundamentally unique function of research from an advisory independent advisory firm you lifted up those guys and you put them inside the market making operation are you following what i'm saying it's like what i'm trying to say is that the provision of research is fundamentally an advisory function so it needs to be treated separately as an advisory function conceptually so when you see a research outfit inside a market making operation, which I told you will happen. Okay. So a market making operation either will outsource its research function. Okay. Which is not, they normally never outsource hundred percent. They outsource some of it. Okay. Either it will outsource its research function, research function, or it will hire its own research analysts. Are you following what I'm saying? Sales training research inside a market making operation. But when you see a research analyst, even if he's working full time for the uh, market making operation, conceptually it is as if an independent research guy has been taken and put inside that operation. Are you following? Maybe I'm making more complicated, making it more complicated than it needs to be. But you understand what it is. Conceptually, that's how you do because research is a separate function. Okay, it's not really a market making function. It's a support function for market making. All right. So uh, if that's what I mean. That's why I have put research as a separate unit because you can provide research separately as an independent research outfit. Okay, which there are many such research outfits. All right, and so all these guys, all that they're doing is fundamentally this. Imagine any asset class, any instrument, all that they're going in and doing is they're giving inf insight into whether the market is going to go up or down and what kind of strategy you should follow, whether you should sell calls, buy puts. Sometimes they would give you complicated uh, strategies like do a call, call uh, bullish call spread and this, that, and do a butterfly spread, all kinds of strategies. But essentially, they will 
provide a directional input on which which way the market is going to go any particular market and then they will also come up with a strategy that is uh, best suited to exploit that kind of market move are you following this kind of research if you're watching your business television you see this on a regular basis in india you see a lot of independent advisors coming in and giving you inputs on what to do with the stock market you notice that if you're watching cnbc tv 18 and all these channels okay so that's what essentially you have to think of that as a fundamentally a research function that is an advisory function that's why i've called it advisory all right and similarly you might have the same guys doing this uh, doing this inside inside a market making operation yeah so you might have this but it's fun fundamentally an advisory function okay is this clear to everybody now okay fundamentally that's what research is about so obviously there's a huge amount of ground to cover because there are major four at least four major asset classes okay you can take five with real estate and then you have all these different instruments okay so there's a massive area to cover so that's why you tend to specialize in research you've noticed already equity analysts if you're listening lots of earnings are coming out now you have lot of these a uh, lot of these so you have either a specialization in autos some people specialize in oil and gas so these guys are so specialized oil and gas equities only so they have restricted the asset class they have restricted the uh, instrument so typically they're talking about spot equities yeah they have further restricted the sector that's the amount of specialization you need okay so you'll also find different independent research firms uh, talking about who only specialize in the oil market or they only specialize in metals okay so because the field is so vast you have to specialize okay whether you are an in-house research so these guys we would call in-house research and these guys are basically independent research outfits okay all right so now coming to m a because m a is so important and there's so much confusion about m a essentially what an m a unit does yes credit rating also comes in the research yes credit trading is also part of research okay so you see independent so when you're looking at all these people like crystal and uh, ikra and care ratings and all these people these are all independent research outfits because what are they doing they're actually giving directional research on which asset class Credit rating companies are giving directional research on what asset class? Debt. 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 Okay, so you have to understand it from this framework, from the general framework. Okay, so you have to, uh, that's the whole point of doing an MBA program. That you should have these conceptual categories in your head, which will help you to make sense of the complexity of the real world. So when you see a research, a credit rating agency, what are they doing? They're essentially providing directional research on, because if you look at their, uh, these credit ratings, okay, what are they essentially saying? A AAA credit rating okay if let's say unilever plc has a triple a credit rating essentially what does that mean that default risk is high or low? Low, low low okay so which means what are they saying that if you buy bonds issued by unilever plc then that bond is unlikely to go down in price okay so you are likely to realize the full value of that bond essentially that's what they're saying okay so therefore in a way they're giving effectively giving directional research because they're giving you certain bounds on the directional movement okay they're saying that this bond price is not likely to go down it will uh, stay stable and you'll realize the full value of it. are you following so you understand why i'm saying that even credit trading agencies are essentially providing directional research because they're giving you certain bounds on the way that asset prices will move is this clear everyone is clear about this okay so now m a essentially is a research function what does an m a unit typically do an m a unit is always hunting for so they will have some potential so you you've already done a course on MA. Yes, yes so you will have acquirers and targets okay let me try and get this down if we can put take down some notes let me get this down to the part where we are i think this is uh, eyeball so that's why this takes a little time to go through So this is already in our market makers, asset managers. We've come to capital raising, debt capital markets. This I'll cover under government uh, thing. So let's just do research. Okay, now let's just do. No, let's just copy it from here. It'll make it easier to understand. Okay. So let's put advisors, and under that, let's put this. So now we are talking about this back category, so that it'll help you. Um, you don't have to take notes uh, all right so what are we talking about directional research this part i think you've understood already okay so all right now let's just talk about m a which is uh, very there's a lot of confusion about m a all 
All right, so MA is essentially a research function. Now, you've done MA, you've heard these terms called acquirer and target. Yes, sir. Okay, so essentially, you have these two categories acquirer and target firms. Um, and so, what these MA, what imagine, and first, we are going to imagine the functioning of a independent MA operation which is not connected to an investment bank okay so to, to make sure that you understand the difference you understand why MA is not investment banking okay or investment banking is not MA. so an independent MA a office uh, boutique okay these are there are many well known very well known MA boutiques okay what would they be doing they would be looking at potential acquirers and potential targets okay and they would what they would do is they would do the analysis okay and they would do the, uh, you know, all the strategy analysis, the financial analysis, etc. And they would come up with an idea that, hey, if G General Electric buys Alcatel, that's a very good strategic fit, okay, for General Electric, for these two companies if they merge. So then they would go, they would do the analysis, okay, they would prepare a pitch book. So you would hear it up in investment banks and other big operations where they already contain m &A teams because they're so big. But let's just purely talk about an m &A shop. So they will have an m &A pitch book. So what they will do now, these guys will go to the uh, acquirer firms and the target firms and they would try to sell the CEOs and the board on the, they would make presentations to the board and they would try to sell the GE and Alcatel boards on the idea that this merger is a good uh, proposition. Is this clear? So that's the fundamental job of uh, M&A. And so you will hear of these terms. Uh, typically you'll hear, I don't know if you've heard, there's a Tom Cruise movie called Rainmaker. Is there a Tom Cruise movie? No, sir. I thought there was okay. Anyway, so the, have you heard this expression rainmaker? No, sir. Okay, so there is a rainmaker is an expression that is used in a lot of these boutique professional service firms. So in MA firms also you have rainmakers, and this is also used in law firms. In law firms also you have rainmakers. A rainmaker is basically a guy who makes rain happen, which means it's the salesman, the guy who brings in business. Okay, so remember the most important, the most the most difficult part of a business is to sell whatever you're providing service or product so when you're running an MA outfit okay there are many well-known m a outfits let's write them down here this will actually prove to you why m a is not investment banking is not m a so there is a firm called wasserstein okay perella which is uh, became perella weinberg okay these are very well-known firms and you can actually cite these as examples if you're actually saying this becomes Perella Weinberg they, okay then there is uh, I'm just giving you some names Green Hill and Company okay I'm just gonna write go okay then you have uh, a very recent formation Moilis company Moilis and Company okay so what are these these are all individual names of individuals okay these are all very well-known m a boutiques I'm going to write down some of the private equity firms also have you guys heard of KKR yes, sir. okay so KKR what was the original name of KKR <laughs> you don't remember okay so KKR oh this is not I'm not talking about Kolkata Nitride <laughs> Oh my god, but that's why <laughs> everyone knows of KKR. Okay, now this is not what we're talking about. So KKR used to be known as Kohlberg, Kravis, Roberts. Okay, now now they have just um, okay, these names are not so important, but uh, point is one minute. So this is an LBO firm. They started out as an LBA firm, LBO firm. Now they're a public listed company that are very diversified alternative asset manager just like you have Carlisle as well as these are all the pre firms okay these are PE firms Carlisle KKR um, Blackstone these are all PE firms but since a lot of PE firms engaged in leverage buyouts mm -hmm. a leverage buyout would be classified under the broad category of MA mm -hmm. okay MA did you do leverage buyouts yes, yes, in MA yes, okay so that's where you use a high level of debt yes. okay and you take a listed company private okay so there are some very pro high profile uh, M&A tra transactions which are uh, essentially LBOs okay have you heard of this movie called barbarians at the gate no, why don't you see it it's on YouTube it will give you a clean for one of the biggest uh, LBO takeovers in history uh, I mean at that time it was the biggest it's called uh, it's on RJR Nabisco just query YouTube barbarians at the gate this is when Tushar is coming in that's what the guards say barbarians are the kid. okay so um, go and query this okay so this is a movie queried on YouTube okay 
and um, uh, and you can watch this movie just fun but it's about the greater uh, that time was the biggest uh, uh, takeover the takeover of Archer and Nabisco by KKR KKR that time was Colbert Cravis Roberts it was a very hotly contested takeover battle you know that these takeover battles are also very hotly cont contested yes, because there are multiple parties okay so essentially all of this falls under M&A M&A should be thought of as mergers acquisitions and divestitures okay M&A and D and so LBOs form a part, LBOs are a type of acquisition where you acquire the company and you take a listed company private. Okay. So now all of these firms, so what are these firms doing? Perella Weinberg, why are these firms called Wasserstein, Perella, Greenhill and Company, Moyles and Company? Moyles is a guy, uh, is the name of a person. Okay. He was, I think he was working for Morgan Stanley. Typically how these firms are uh, developed is they're working for big investment banks for many years. Okay, and the big investment banks have M&A departments, but that doesn't mean that investment banking is M&A. So they work there, they build up a list of contacts, they develop very good contacts in the industry. And then later on, they leave the investment bank and they start their own boutique M&A firm. Okay, so none of these M&A firms are called investment banks. These are all called boutique M&A firms and they are providing the pure form of the M&A function. Okay, the M&A advisory function. What are these guys? Why is this called Moelis and Company? Because Moelis is the rainmaker. He is the guy with all the contacts because remember the most difficult job in an M&A outfit is to go and convince the GE board and G, uh, convince the Alcatel board that this merger is a good proposition number one and number two my firm Moelis's company Moelis and company is best positioned to advise you on this transaction because if I advise you I'll get the advisory fees okay because then on the you know just after me, Saksham is coming in to represent Wasserstein Perella and he's going to give the same pitch that this is a good proposition, but Wasserstein Perella is much better positioned than Moelis and company to advise you on this transaction. So don't give the deal to them, give the deal to me. So you have a parade of all these M&A outfits lining up at the doors of potential acquirers and targets, trying to pitch the deal to them and make sure that they get the advisory mandate. They get the advisory mandate because then they'll get the lion's share of the fees. So this is why so these this is why these named firms are named after them because they are the rainmakers these people who go and so this is the importance of salesmanship you have to this is fundamentally a sales job you understand that you should understand that as well many people look down on sales but at the end of the day a huge amount of business is just based on relationship of building relationships being able to sell okay so how do you make sure that all the other guys get pushed out and you get the deal this is a purely relationship uh, job. It's a, it's a, it's fundamentally it's a sales job. And those who have the ability to do these deals, they are called the rainmakers because they are the ones who bring in the business. So once they bring in the business, okay, then all the little uh, junior associates and everybody will start scrambling, doing analysis, running spreadsheets, some of the stuff that you guys are going to be doing with these. Sir, maybe you'll do some MA analysis. So they'll be running all these spreadsheets and preparing all these reports and stuff and preparing better and better pictures etc but the fundamental function you have to understand the business the fundamental business is to basically go there the salesman has to go there make the case first convince the board that this deal needs to be done and that i am my firm is the best firm to advise you not all these other guys standing outside okay so understand this so this is why these are called these guys are called rainmakers okay these are the guys and the same thing in a law firm so many law firms who gets the business for Tata for the Tata Sons group okay so uh, some law, law firm partner goes in and makes the case that that law firm is best positioned to advise uh, uh, Tata Sons is this clear so understand this function okay are you guys following yes, sir. okay good so now this understand the so you've understood the M&A business now have you understood the heart of the M&A business this is what it is you keep on doing research on companies find some feasible targets where you think there's a reasonably good chance of convincing the convincing the companies that this deal can work and then your rainmakers go out and start hitting those targets okay and we'll here actually one is already called a target but that is basically your sales target now you go and start hitting those companies and you go and try to convince them that they should do the deal and make you the advisor okay and these MA advisors correct very high fees you know sometimes three to five percent six percent depending on the size of the deal and these mergers are obviously very big some you know nowadays heard hundred billion dollar mergers are quite common okay all right so this is the fund fun fundamental m a function now why do people confuse m a with investment banking why does that happen okay let's go back to the sheet here all right now let's look at this okay let's hopefully we can get everything in the same view 
Yeah. Okay. So now what happens it what happens is in the large investment banks. So the first thing you have to understand is that when you look at the essence of the M&A function, it's an advisory function. It has nothing in in general to do with M&A with investment banking. So these uh, these well known M&A boutiques like the Moyles and Company, Greenhill and Company, Wasista and Perala Weinberg, all these guys, they have been functioning for years as pure M&A boutiques and nobody calls them investment banks and they're doing fine. Okay, they can make a lot of money from fees. They have very low overheads. Overheads are very low. Okay, because you just have a bunch of people and that's your, that's your asset basically as they say that the assets go up and down and the assets of the firm go up and down in the elevator. Have you heard this expression? The assets of the firm go up and down in the elevator every day. Because it's a way of saying that the assets are mainly just people. You don't have factories and R&D licenses and this and that. The assets of the firm are just the people. Okay, so overheads are low, they make a lot of money. Nothing necessarily connects M&A firms to investment banking. But what happens is, it so happens that the very large investment banks, so investment banking in the modern world is a game of scale. So you have very large investment banks like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, okay, JP Morgan Investment Bank, then Citigroup, although it's Citigroup is technically a bank, but it operates in the same fields, okay, so it runs an investment bank. Now all of these, and then you have the European players like Barclays, okay, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, Okay, which is in a lot of trouble now. Deutsche Bank is now being considered for a merger with Commerce Bank. Okay, because Deutsche is in so much trouble. So, uh, but anyway, so you have all these uh, European players, all these big banks. These are very big banks. So, because of their size, what happens is they have they happen to include an M&A unit as well. They place an M&A unit, okay, inside their investment bank, and you'll see why there is a reason for that. But just because that it, just because in the large investment banks you can find M&A units, that does not mean that investment banking is M&A or M&A is investment bank. Are you following what I'm saying? Because if you go to an outfit like if you go to a large Haldirams unit like in the one in Kalant place, I think you can get pizza as well. Yes, okay, sir. but if you classify Haldirams as an Indian sweet shop, that does not mean that Indian sweet shops sell pizza. Okay, this just so happens that that outfit is so large. They're trying to cater to a wide base and they're trying to make most use of their overhead. I mean, uh, maximal, maximize the sales. So they're selling different types of, uh, they can add some product lines as well, like pizza and maybe noodles and stuff like that. Okay. So this is what it is. This is essentially the reason why people confuse investment banking with M&A. Okay. And what is the other connection? Can you make another connection? You know what? So fundamentally, there are two things that get confused with investment banking. Uh, one without absolutely any reason, which is M&A. The second is the market making operation, which is the secondary capital markets operation. That also need not exist purely. You can have some, these days it's becoming very rare because it's, it's a game of scale. But in the early days of investment banking, there were pure primary capital markets operations. Okay, so the essence of the investment banking function is the primary capital market function. Is this clear? What is primary capital markets? But yeah. No, not yes. I'm asking you. <laughs> you're, saying, you're saying yes. <laughs> what is primary capital markets? Give her the mic. What is the core function of a primary capital market operation? Mic passing. Your baton relay is very slow. You will not win the relay. Yes. Oh, Uncle, when you went out your door, you left the door open. You will not get a Japanese management diploma. Okay. Yes, but yeah. What is the, what is the explain to me the core function of a primary capital markets operation? One minute, one minute. I'm asking her. Yes. What happened? You don't know. You don't know or you're not able to articulate what you know? That is also not a, uh, acceptable. No? You are going to be graduating from an MBA program as a finance student and you can't articulate such a basic question. The answer to such a basic question. Who is going to help us next? Okay, now Achal has already answered many questions. Okay, Niketa, can you help? One minute. Can you tell us what is the, uh, what is the core function of a primary capital markets operation? Primary capital markets. Let's say we have an organization which only provides a which only provides a primary capital markets uh, service. Okay, so what are they doing? What do they do? One minute, quiet, please. Voice has to be coming through the mic. Voice needs to be coming through the mic. It's not working. Okay, tell tell me then what is it? Yeah, 
They facilitate capital formation. Anything else? Okay, that's not a good enough answer. Yes, Tushar, give him the mic. Sir, I don't Sir, it's not working. I don't need work. Oh, it's not working. Okay, fine. Then just hang on to it. Yeah. So what is the core function of a primary capital markets operation? So, firstly, it's issuing of securities through IPOs. Uh, it is a uh, it is a company's first contact. Use it. Use it. It is a company's first contact to the customers directly to the customers and uh, in the form of IPO. Sir, okay, give it's not a satisfactory answer. Sir, it is the very simple from uh, fund surplus entities to fund deficit entities. Okay, and the form of what kind of and by by what process we detail the process? IPOs by uh, IPOs is one of the type and buybacks is also covered under primary capital market. Yeah. So, but what you really have to mention here is that uh, yeah, this is a good way of explaining it that there is a matching of funds deficit entities and funds uh, surplus entities in the economy. <laughs> And the way it actually works is you have to explain the primary capital markets transaction, which is that the funds deficit in, uh, entities will issue capital securities. So in the industry, don't say capital securities. I say capital securities to drill into your head that those capital securities are for two forms of capital debt and equity. But in the market, you just say securities. Okay. So by issuing securities, the deficit entities will issue securities, and in return for that, the fund surplus entities will invest in those debt and equity securities or the hybrid securities. So you can now talk about debt, equity and hybrid. Okay. They will invest in those securities and thereby provide capital to the funds deficit ent entities. Is this clear? This is how the question should be answered. Okay. So very basic stuff. I can see that may many people are not able to give proper answers. Okay. But you think that you know. All right. And then, okay. So, so understand so that the core, uh, the fundamental investment banking function is actually the primary capital markets function, okay, which in the olden days when scale was not such a big factor, there used to be pure primary capital markets operations operating as investment banks and those were the classical investment banks or merchant banks. Merchant banks is the British term, okay. So then very soon what happens and the other thing that gets uh, tied up with investment banks is obviously, uh, let's give them a connection here maybe all right so there is a connection the the other thing that eventually as scale became more and more important one of the things that the uh, these uh, in institutional investors when the teams used to go and try and sell them securities which part of the primary capital markets operation goes to the investor and tries to sell them the securities is my question clear yes, sir. in the primary capital markets operation we had talked about three core types of teams yes. which of those three teams goes to the investors and tries to sell them on the securities try to convince tries to convince them to buy the securities yes, distribution right is this clear yes, we talked about origination distribution and structuring okay out of which actually origination and distribution are the two most important structuring need not be involved in every transaction so actually we can have two primary categories and you have a third category of team which gets involved occasionally all right so the distribution team when it's going and talking to the institutional investors trying to convince them to buy the securities okay one of the things that the institutional investors would say is fine i'm willing to buy it but are you going to be making a market in these securities because later on if i want to sell some of my stock or my bonds or if I want to buy some more, am I am, am, I, am I going to get a ready price? I want a ready-made two uh, two-way price. Okay, I should be able to press a button or pick up a phone and call somebody for a two-way price. So, are you providing that market-making facility? So that's why now, as scale became more and more important, the secondary capital markets function also became kind of essential to an investment bank because you would not get the mandate. Okay, and this is actually this kind of uh, secondary capital markets market making support from uh, this promise that the investment banks had to make okay they had to promise that they would provide the market making support are you following what no yes. who is saying no you're following or not following huh. so then if you're not following you need to be more vocal about it you know, I, I can't keep looking at people's faces and trying to you need to help me with the whole process here the process is that i'm explaining some stuff Keshav is sitting in the back row and looking at his WhatsApp. Okay, so uh, if you are if you are not following, you need to be engaged. If you are not following, then you should immediately put up your hand and ask a question because I can't uh, keep looking at everybody's face and figuring out whether this person has understood or not. 
if certain things are being said and you haven't understood you need to participate in the class okay so uh, therefore then what is the which part did you not follow no speak in english i know you're going back to your dad's business but we need to inculcate this culture in the business school because english is the language nothing wrong with hindi okay it's a great language but hindi is not the language of global business so we are training students in a business school it's not appropriate for us to be speaking in anything other than english because our you have to be clear about the mission our mission is to produce outstanding business school graduates okay so that part of that is training to speak in english okay all the time yes so what is the difference between origination and structuring? What is the difference between origination and structuring? Okay, or originator structurer? Who's going to explain that to him? Is this question clear? Yes, sir. Within primary capital markets, we have three types of teams: origination, distribution, and structuring. And Sahil is not clear as to what is the difference between origination and structuring. Okay, in, in English. Okay, who Lakshya is going to explain it to him? Give him the mic. Is the mic working? Yes, sir. Yes. Mic is working. Give it to Lakshya, who will look up temporarily from his WhatsApp and explain the uh, question. Is the question clear to you? Uh, question is: What is the difference between origination and structuring? Within primary capital markets, what is the difference between somebody, if say Prachi is on the structuring team and uh, Bhatia is on the origination team, what is the difference between what they do? Okay, double A, give it to double A. No, you don't know? Is my question clear? So who will explain? All everything is getting explained by Achal. Okay, let's give it to Achal. One minute. We can't even waste a, afford to spend so much time on this. But you guys, everybody else, I mean, I happen to catch Sahil in the act, but everybody else, I hope when you don't understand, make sure you ask a question. Okay? Otherwise, what's the point? Am I coming here and giving you a lecture and you haven't understood and you're keeping quiet? This is a very big problem. Uh, this happens only in India, you know. I mean, maybe some other countries also, Southeast Asian countries, very peculiar cultural. This will never happen in Western countries. Anytime they don't understand, they'll ask a question. Okay. So yes, go ahead, Achal. So the origination team basically does a job of sales. Uh, they go to the companies that are planning to launch IPO, and they'll say that uh, we can get you so much of subscription, and uh, they'll convince them in. Uh, then go ahead with it. Whereas the structuring team would work with the tax and legal aspects of that uh, issue, or uh, if they are planning to come out with, uh, uh, I, if they work with tax and legal uh, legal aspects of that idea. Okay, so essentially, uh, your answer is more uh, more or less correct. Okay, 90, 95, 95 percent correct. So what you should have clarified is also that structuring need not be involved in every transaction. That they get involved in the complex transactions. If it's a plain vanilla transaction, standardized, it's I mean the the process is already set. Okay, so sales function actually don't say sales because sales is involved even on the distribution side. Okay, so essentially what you said in the second part of your answer is correct that they go and convince the origination team. His, uh, the, their job is to go to Jack Ma and convince them that the Alibaba IPO should be given to uh, Credit Suisse only as the lead manager and not to Deutsche Bank or to Goldman Sachs or anybody else. Okay, so the origination team of uh, Credit Suisse will go and pitch. So again, the same business. Can you see once again a sales function just like M&A? Different M&A boutiques are going to the same firm and telling them that we should be the M&A advisor. Same here, these uh, different investment banks origination teams are going and lining up like what is happening with the Saudi Aramco IPO. There's a bunch of investment bankers literally parked in Saudi Arabia, although the IPO has kept on getting delayed because the Saudi Aramco IPO will be the big, you know who Saudi Aramco is, right? That is like their Indian oil or ONGC, okay? The, all the Saudi oil reserves have been transferred into Aramco now, okay? So they are basically the Saudi Arabian National Oil Company. So there is a there is a talk about some kind of um, you know partial sale of shares, okay, which is going to become the biggest IPO ever by a wide margin. Okay, it's getting pushed forward a little bit because of several uh, problems with the oil price and all that uh, other problems. So essentially, um, so what was I saying? So there's a bunch of these. So again, you notice, try to understand the sales, how sales become important, uh, sales become, becomes important in various types of businesses and at what stage and understand what is actually involved. Okay. So again, the, the rainmakers and the investment banks are going to be those guys 
who are from mainly from the origination teams. Okay, the rainmakers and the investment banks in the primary capital market operation will be from the origination team. They are the stars who go and convince big companies like Saudi Aramco to give the lead manager mandate because the lead manager will take the lion's share of the fees. Okay, so they are the ones who go and convince when there's competition between so many investment banks. So these are the guys who will go and convince them that give the mandate to Credit Suisse. Don't give it to Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. And then they manage to convince them. Okay, so that's why they are more, they would also be known as rainmakers. Okay, on the origination side. Is this clear? Yes, sir. You understand the concept of rainmaker as well? Yes. It's the guys who, because, and this also highlights the importance of sales. Okay, people look down on sales, but heart of every business is sales. You may have a mediocre product. Many companies worldwide who are like, who are multi billion dollar caps, market caps, who products may be quite mediocre. But superb branding and superb sales, uh, superb okay. sales and distribution network. Okay, so it's all about selling the product, creating demand for the product. That's the heart of every business. Okay, so don't lose sight of that. Okay, so what were we? The story that we were on is that you can have the pure form of the investment banking function is the primary capital markets function. Is this clear? Then, because of this importance, uh, increasing importance of scale, the people demand both the issuer and the investors. Both of them started demanding that there should be a secondary market in the securities. Those securities which are being sold in the primary market, uh, uh, you know, operation, there should be a secondary market in those securities. Was this, this was being demanded by both the issuer and the investor? Okay, fundamentally, it's an investor demand, and that's why the issuer also insists on it because it helps him to sell the securities to the investor. Okay, so the demand for a, a, a secondary market operation. All right, so uh, now we are talking about M&A and investment banking. Okay, connection. Okay, so um, investment bank, PCM. Connection reestablished. Okay, investment bank is first started with PCM. Then it adds the SCM. Okay, because people start demanding, the investors start demanding that there should be an SCM, there should be a market making op operation, a secondary market may be, should be made in these securities. Okay. Now, why do people confuse m &A with investment banking and what is the connection? This is where I'm going to ask you the question. Okay. And why do large investment banks uh, have m &A, One of the what is one of the reasons for having the m and unit within the investment bank is can you see uh, knowing what an investment bank does? Okay. What is the connection do you see? What connection do you see between an M&A transaction and the core function of an investment bank? Who's going to answer? Is my question clear? No, knowing what an investment bank does, knowing the PCM function, which is the core function of an investment bank. Okay. What, what kind of connection can you establish between the core function of an investment bank and an M&A transaction that is going to happen? Let's say AB, AB in BEV, which, uh, makes all these, uh, a lot of these beers like Corona and all these other beers was a, re a few years ago, they bought Sap Miller, okay, which makes all these uh, Miller Lite and all these other beers. So when AB and Bell, that's a huge m and transaction, that's about $120 billion or something like that, okay. So over $100 billion. Now, when they buy, so AB and Bell has to buy, has to shell out of, let's say $120 billion, okay, and they have to buy this from the, so everything has been finalized, okay, the boards have agreed. Now the transaction needs to happen. They need to shell out $120 billion. Let's assume that it's an all cash transaction. Okay. So typically, um, so establish a connection for me between an M&A transaction that is happening. Okay. That needs to happen and the primary function of an investment bank, the PCM uh, function of the investment bank. I shouldn't even have given you the PCM clue. Is my question clear now? Still not clear. <coughs> So a, let's put it this way: AB InBev has to give 120 billion dollars to the shareholders of um, of um, SAP Miller, okay, SAB Miller. So why would AB InBev need an investment bank? Due diligence for what? No, no. Sorry, all cash. No. So first of all, tell me from what you've learned in M&A. What are the different ways to pay for an acquisition? Sir, sir, all cash. One minute. Cash. One minute. One is all cash. Sir, shares. Shares. Okay. So either you pay in cash or you pay in shares. Okay. Or so now where is the cash going to come from? Sir, 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 
So either you might have cash reserve like companies like Apple have massive reserves of cash on their balance sheet Okay, but every company doesn't have that much cash. Okay, so let's assume that AB InBev Does not want to pay for this deal in stock. In fact, they use some amount of stock Okay, but let's assume that AB InBev does not want to pay for this transaction in stock and they don't have 120 billion dollars worth of cash lying on their books Okay so then what is the connection between this transaction and an investment bank? So the, uh, the company would be raising the funds to the market. Right, that's the answer I was looking for. So obviously, is this kind of obvious? I'm not, I'm surprised why nobody is responding. Maybe you haven't understood my question. So if AB InBev needs to buy, needs to shell out $120 billion for uh, the purchase of Sam Miller, and they're not willing to use their own stock for the purchase, okay? And they don't have 120 billion dollars worth of cash on their balance sheet then obviously they need to raise the money from somewhere yes, sir. right and who raises money investment who helps people to raise money investment, investment banks okay so that's the connection okay so that's why typically you will find that large so there's a synergy you read about synergy yes, and strategy yes, sir. so there is a synergistic element between the two operations of the investment bank of a large investment bank okay uh, there is a let's put it this way there is a synergy between a primary capital markets operation and a MA operation because if an MA operation is able to advise uh, is, is able to get the advisory mandate okay they may have a certain edge in also raising the capital because now you know that capital needs to be raised Market what happens everybody's dozing off yes sir maybe i should just switch off this sound here it keeps on uh, telling us about the mark so what we do know is that the data connection keeps on going off yes. and okay all right so I don't know, I'm, I'm looking at people and they're looking kind of like they're dozing off <laughs> what happened are you not following <laughs> okay so MA an m a transaction where they don't want to use stock and they don't have enough cash obviously money will have to be raised and who do you go to when you need to raise money you go to a primary capital markets operation and an investment bank right so that's where you see the natural synergy between a primary capital markets operation and an MA advisory m a unit okay an advisory m a advisory unit because they can get the mandate and then it gives you definitely if you've got the advisory mandate in the m a transaction definitely you would definitely have an advantage when you're talking about talking to the same issue when you're talking to ab and bef about managing their lead managing their bond issue in this transaction i think they had to issue about 75 billion dollars worth of debt okay so that will have to be issued by which uh, unit which part of the investment ecm or dcm 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 right the debt capital markets unit within the primary capital markets operation would have to be involved in the issuance of that 75 billion dollar bond issue from AB InBev, mm. all right. So if you are, let's say, if you are uh, Deutsche Bank and your advisory M&A unit has uh, captured the uh, advisory mandate, then the Deutsche Bank uh, DCM unit would all definitely have an advantage over other teams in getting the mandate to sell the bonds. And are, do these investment banks sell the bonds for free? No, sir. So they get a fee. Yes. Sir. Okay. So they get a collector uh, underwriting. They would underwrite the bonds. They would sell the bonds. They would get a selling fee. Okay, lead managing the issue. They would get all the fees for that. Okay, so are you able to see that there's a synergistic uh, connection between uh, primary capital markets and M and A? Yes. Sir. Okay. So this is one of the reasons why large investment banks have M and A units. Mm -hmm. Okay, because there's a natural synergy in the way they go and pitch to companies, and then there's a natural coverage of customers. Because remember, at the end of the day, everything is about all businesses about customer relationship development and maintaining the relationship. Okay, so you all the time you see people going on calls from the PCM unit, from the MA unit, going on calls, meeting customers. Okay, so you're meeting all these corporate customers, institutional customers. How you get so you that's how you found find out what they need, and that's where you see the connection and the opportunity to sell your products and services. Are you following yes, sir. you get an understanding of how business is done okay so because people see that the large investment banks contain m a units that's why people who haven't thought uh, in, in depth about the problem uh, tend to uh, have this miss uh, this wrong impression that investment banking is m a 
Okay, it's not MA because as you've seen, hopefully now you've understood that MA is a pure advisory function, whereas investment banking involves all kinds of execution functions. When you actually have to go and sell the securities, you have to lead manage the issue. These are all things that have to be actively done. Okay, these are all execution functions. Whereas MA is pure advisory. You sit at your desk, you analyze the companies, and you see that GE and Alcatel, if they combine, it'll be a great combination. And then you just need the ex extra part on the sales side to go and convince these companies that they should do the deal and give it to your M&A boutique. They give the advisory mandate to you. Are you following? Yes, so M&A, so there are three things which are normally confused, okay? Which is, I'm gonna put it at a, with a question mark so that you understand, okay? So normally you will see in a large, these are called full service, have you heard the term full service? Full, these are called full service investment banks. Okay, some of these brokers are also called full service brokers, which means they provide the entire suite of services. So in the large full service investment banks, you will find M&A units, but that does not mean that M&A is investment banking or investment banking is M&A. Okay, just like remember that if you go to Haldiram's Karat place, you can buy pizza and noodles, but that doesn't mean that Indian sweet shops sell pizza and noodles. Okay, is this clear? Okay, so we've covered some. Uh, no, no, uh, so this uh, there's some sound coming from this side. Uh, I don't know who's responsible for that, but okay. So we go back to. All right. So where are we? Advisors. Advisory function has been covered. You've understood the two main advisory functions. Okay. It's fundamentally M and A. Uh, on, the only reason I highlighted M and A as a separate advisory function is because M and A is so important. Okay, and so active uh, a sector. All right, so I'm not going to cover every particular type of firm. I think you guys have done a course on insurance. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, you heard of reinsurance. Yes, sir. Okay, you need all these. You heard of these companies like Munich Re, Swiss Re. These are all reinsurance companies. Okay, so they deal with the insurers and they try to take on some of their risk. Okay, so I'm not going to deal with this in detail, but government treasury I am going to deal with because this gives us an opportunity. So understand that the government treasury is a separate type of uh, unique kind of player, a very unique kind of player that exists in every country. Okay, and in, uh, in most countries you'll have this. So remember that because it's only the government that like uh, I think Boyle was saying the other day that uh, companies can issue treasury bills. Companies do not issue treasury bills. Only the government treasury can issue treasury bills. Okay. Companies will issue things like commercial paper. All right. So the government treasury has been listed here as one of the players. Okay. One of the prototypical firms, although it's not really a firm because they perform a very unique function. So that's why I've listed them as a separate function, as a separate category. And let's copy this and go to our notes and talk about something very important. And I'm going to use, uh, does the government issue equity? Okay, so the government doesn't, when the government needs to raise capital, it typically issues only debt. It does not issue equity. So we are going to use this opportunity, having highlighted the government treasury the as. PSUs raise the equity. Yeah, but the PSUs are not government. Because what is the what is the case we did yesterday, uh, two days ago, when Krithi told us that what was the what was the message of the what was the ratio of the Solomon case? Corporate corporation in the legal entity so ONGC is not the Indian government SBI is not the Indian government okay so uh, therefore we will not keep them as uh, so we're gonna just we are going to use the discussion of the government Treasury to discuss very a uh, very important aspect of debt capital markets which is the pricing of uh, debt securities I don't think we've covered this have we covered no, three components of a government Treasury uh, of, a, of a corporate debt uh, uh, corporate bond deal okay uh, all right now let's look at um, let's start with this okay now when you look at when you look at a corporate bond deal okay let's look at it let's say if I tell you that uh, the bonds of Airtel are selling at say uh, no obviously whenever you remember one thing very clearly whenever you're talking about let me write this down it's so important any discussion of interest rates any discussion of interest rates clarify what are the two important things if I tell you that bonds are selling at 
corporate bonds are selling at 10 at a yield of 10 percent a YTM you know YTM yes, okay so if I tell you if I make a statement to you that corporate bond a corporate bond is selling at 10 percent okay at a YTM of 10 percent in what ways is this information incomplete what else do you need to know in order to understand exactly uh, in order to understand uh, this uh, in, I mean the situation more clearly one by one by one by one yes to shark so maybe flexible interest rate or fixed interest rate? No, no, no. If it is a YTM of 10 percent, then it's a fixed interest rate. Otherwise, I would have mentioned something like LIBOR plus 40 basis points. It is trading at three month LIBOR plus 40 basis points. Therein, I've given you a clue. Yes. Who is going to answer this? Majority. Let's ask Dina before she falls asleep. Okay. What else? When we discuss a typical interest rate, what are the when I've given you information like uh, a corporate bond is selling at 10% uh, YTM? What two important pieces of information have I left out? Right. Which you need? Uh, no, if we mention the YTM, that's fine. But we we need two important two other important pieces of information that should be mentioned when discussing any interest rate. What have I left out here? If I say a corporate bond is selling at 10% YTM. Yes, give her the mic. Is the mic working? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Give her the mic. Where's the mic? Is my question clear? Is my question clear? When I make a statement like this, a corporate bond is selling at a YTM of 10%. What two important pieces of information have I left out which should always be mentioned whenever you mention an interest rate? The time period. Okay, one is the time period. Good. What is the other one? Time, by time period you mean the tenor yeah. right okay that is what maturity does this refer to okay is it a three month interest rate or is it a six month interest rate or a 10 year interest rate nothing has been mentioned I just said a corporate bond has a YTM of 10 is trading at a YTM of 10 so one point is correct which is the time period to which the de duration of the debt security to which this yield refers okay what is the other one Okay, the other one, issue, anybody else? Issue a discount or a premium or a, or a service value. Discount. No, that's not really important. We are now concerned with the market situation. Anybody else on the other point? Is my question clear? Akshit, can you help us? No? You are helping uh, Giri. Okay. Okay, who else? Who else can help? Is the question clear? What is the other important piece of information? Yeah, so if I make a statement that a corporate bond is uh, trading at a YTM of 10%, what two important pieces of information have I left out, which should always be mentioned when discussing any interest rate, uh, because otherwise the discussion is not meaningful. So one part Dina has clarified that I should have mentioned the maturity of the debt instrument to which this YTM refers. So is this clear? Maybe the rating of the bond. Okay, you're getting close to it, which is that the issuer what is the credit grade of the issuer that should be mentioned okay because otherwise it's not meaningful like would you if you have to lend money to uh, let's say that uh, let's assume for the sake of argument that the government bond yield is zero the government bond yield which is a reference is zero mm -hmm. then if you're if you're lending money to Unilever for 10 years at say 2% would you lend money to say uh, before the bankruptcy Kingfisher Airlines or uh, you know any other what was that uh, Suslon which is an airline company or today if you have Jet Airways yes, okay mm -hmm. so if you are lending money to Unilever PLC for 10 years at, at, at 2 percent would you lend money for 10 years to Jet Airways at 2 percent no, not at all right because the credit quality of Jet Airways is much worse than the, that of Unilever okay or ITC which are all cash rich companies okay so therefore the second piece of information that needs to be mentioned is ideally the name of the issue but more importantly what is the credit grade to which that because we have credit ratings okay so what is the credit grade look at this thing here while we're talking let's look at this this is a you don't need to memorize the credit ratings but you should have this link and then if you need to refer to credit ratings you should be able to refer to it one minute yeah the, the sovereigns also have credit ratings let me just find out where the rating uh, there should be yeah here so this is you can just keep the you don't have to remember this okay so here you have the different providers 
Moody's, S&P and Fitch are the two main and the three main credit rating companies. These are the giant credit rating companies. So you have these two. Uh, so you have to remember. We don't need to remember the names. Of, I mean, this is okay. We can let it go a little bit. So you see the investment grade and below investment grade. Okay. So you need to. Uh, the second important piece of information that needs to be mentioned in order to make any discussion of interest rates meaningful is the issuer and uh, immediately after that the credit grade of the issuer. Okay. So maybe Jet Airways is a junk issuer, okay, below investment grade. Unilever PLC is obviously a probably a AAA rated uh, entity, okay. So you do not lend money for the same duration to these two types of entities at the same rate. So therefore, when you're talking about the interest rate, two important things that must always be mentioned is the issuer and the credit quality or the credit grade to which the issuer belongs or that interest rate pertains okay or and the duration of the debt instrument for which that uh, to which that uh, for which the ytm is being quoted is this is clear yes. two important factors now quickly this link is already in your notes so these are the this is the these are the, the actual labels are not important but this distinction between investment grade and below investment grade okay is important non-investment grade okay so this is where uh, i think india's credit rating is somewhere like b a b double a two or something like that we are just above investment grade okay uh, which is actually a tragedy we should have managed our economy much better we should have been a triple a rated sovereign 70 years after independence it's, it, this is a joke basically anyway so anyway so uh, but you need to understand the difference between investment grade and below investment grade essentially what we are saying is these are subpar credit quality companies below investment grade so be careful they have a high probability of default okay these are known as junk bonds okay and the the euphemism for junk bonds is you know what a euphemism is we want to be politically correct okay junk is junk is actually junk bond markets they are also called high yield okay you don't want to call somebody junk so you want to be politically correct so you evolve this new term called high yield okay so um, high yield is a euphemism for junk bond markets for junk bonds okay so this below investment grade is these are called junk bonds okay now let's quickly uh, recap this very important uh, concept that you need to learn along with once you've understood that two important factors need to be now let's talk about this okay when you're lending money to jet airways okay um what are how will you define let's say jet airways comes to you and says I want to borrow money for five years okay I want to issue a debt security to you and I want to borrow money for five years okay and suppose saying no is not an option all you have to do is all the only thing you're allowed to do is you're allowed to quote an interest rate so you're allowed to say to them okay you want to borrow money you want to borrow a hundred million dollars for me for uh, ten, for five years this is what you have to pay me this is the YTMI demand on the bond okay so if the bond is issued at par that means the coupon on the bond let's say it's an annual coupon if the bond is sold at par which is at the face value of the bond then the if you are demanding a 15 percent coupon the 15 percent ytm for five years that means it'll have to have a 15 percent coupon if the bond is sold as par everyone follows okay so now what answer will you how will you arrive at your answer now i'm not interested in what the answer is what is the logical step what are the logical steps that you are going to follow in deriving your figure of the interest rate that you want to charge to jet airways if you are required to lend to them for five years Sir, there are some clues to help us speed up the process there are some clues for you on the screen yes give him the mic is the mic working just like our data uh, our internet connection keeps going on and off uh, the mic also seems to keep going on and off this is like yes go ahead first we look about the rf and the mic is not voice is not Hello. going yes what, let the voice come through the mic so first we look about the rf in the economies so suppose rf in india is six six percent what is rf risk -free rate okay of okay fine so first you want to identify the risk-free rate of return yes sir. okay and then so then we look about the uh, beta of the jet airways better way Okay, beta of jet airways. This is beta from the capital asset pricing model. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, so then, uh, so risk free rate, can I say, can I just call it the government bond yield? Yes, sir. Okay. So what Goyal is saying, okay, guys, please pay attention. These are all important concepts that you need to be clear uh, about. Okay. Corporate debt pricing. We are now learning about how the market prices corporate debt. Okay. So Goyal is telling you that first you look at the risk free rate for five years we take the five-year government bond yield 
Okay, then are you willing to lend to them at the same rate? No, because JW is a poorer quality credit than the government of India. Okay, now what else? How else will you derive this? What else? Rate of inflation in the economy. Okay, will you add the rate of inflation? Okay, so you are adding the rate of inflation as a separate factor. Okay, now the current rate of inflation or the projected uh, projected inflation. Okay, now let me stop you here. One sec. Have you guys followed what he's saying? Yes. Don't worry, we have an alarm. Ayush. We have an alarm. Okay. All right. One minute. So Ayush is uh, sorry. Uh, Goyal is saying that in addition to the government bond yield, you need to factor in the expected inflation. My question to you is: Does the government bond yield not factor in the expected inflation when you are lending? Let's let's change the question. Instead of lending to Jet Airways, now you are lending to the government of India. Will you in quoting the rate of interest to the government of India? Suppose you have decided to quote eight percent. Okay. So in quoting this 8%, would you have taken in the expected, would you have factored in the expected inflation? Yes. yes. So then the government bond yield already contains the expected inflation. And the expected inflation is not going to change for lending to Jet Airways or to government of India. It's the same inflation. Yeah. Right? So you, need, you don't need expected inflation. Anything else you want to add? Mm. Anybody else wants to add anything? Money lender, any money lender here? Sir, balance sheet of the company. Balance sheet of the company, so what will you do? Sir, if it is a, a purely equity company, if it is a, a light in process, so then it will be at, at a much lesser rate. And if it covers a debt, so sir, they are involved. Already. No, no, this is, we are not, there is no equity issuance involved here. We are talking about debt. We are talking about the pricing of a debt security to be issued by Jet Airways. Sir, what I am trying to say that if there is a, there is only a equity. Why is there so much now? Bola is going to lose points. I know that I know no, no. <laughs> yes, we will deduct your points later. I will remember your name. Okay. Sir, yes. We are only talking about the pricing of a debt security to be issued by Jet Airways. Sir, that's what I am saying. Yeah, one sec. Be quiet here. Yeah. If it is a debt free company. So, sir, the expectation of the uh, uh, of the equity investor would be much lesser than uh, than if it is a debt. Uh, if there is a debt in the company. Okay, you are talking about the leverage uh, ratio of the uh, of the company. Yes, sir. Okay, so higher leverage ratios, you would charge them higher rates of interest. Okay, so fine. Anything else? Okay, let's now wrap up this discussion quickly to figure out this point. Okay, very simple. Remember this: when you price a corporate debt security, this doesn't come in here because it's already in the government bond deal. Is this clear? When you charge, when you are lending to the government of India also, you need to take care of yourself, protect yourself against expected inflation. Okay. So the government bond yield plus what is called the credit spread. This is called the credit spread. So what you are going to do typically the way it actually works is you will figure out that Jet Airways is whatever, let's say, let's call it uh, BA3. Okay. Or let's call this the double B minus. These three things are easier to read. Let's say Jet Airways is great, rated double B minus. Okay. So you will go in. So first you'll notice what the five year government bond yield is. Then you'll go into the market. You'll look into your Bloomberg or Reuters. And you know that Jet Airways is rated. Dina has rated them double B minus. Okay. So now you will go into the market into your Bloomberg and look at the credit spread for double B minus for five years. For all double B minus credit uh, credit rated companies, for all double B, double B minus rated companies, there will be an average credit spread. Okay, let's say that is three percent. Okay, so you will go and look at you first find out Jet Airways is double B minus. Then you go and look at your Bloomberg double B minus. What is the credit spread right now for five years? Okay, because there will be a different credit spread for ten years. So then you add, let's say that's three percent. So if your government bond yield was, let's say it's eight percent. Okay. Then the credit spread is this is you understood how you find out the credit spread. Yes. Okay. Then the credit spread is let's say 3%. So then you decide, then you tell Mr. Goyal, that is Naresh Goyal, that Naresh Goyal of Jet Airways, you tell him if you want to borrow money from me for five years, I'm going to charge you 11%, at least 11%. You might want to take a little bit extra for just for margin, but the, the market equilibrium will be 11%. Uh, okay. Yeah, is this now you follow? Yes, sir. sir. Okay, Someone so this is remember this that this is how corporate now don't jump yet. There's one more point left. Uh, one minute, forget the budget. There is a bell that I've given. Oh, the bell is ringing. Oh, yeah, I know why the bell is not because I put this on silent. No, I put the bell. Okay, well, so it's only 11. The time
time is exactly uh, correct, okay? One minute. Okay, you can go now. I hope you absorb something. It's not like stuff going over your head all the time and people are sleeping. Okay.